So I want to talk about um, some efforts we're making to improve the efficiency of generating operational ET estimates. And I'm going to just jump right in because hopefully it'll, it'll explain it a little better. Um, the Desert Research Institute and the Nevada Division, Division of Water Resources are working together to apply metric um, in western Nevada. That was our original project, and it's the four Landsat scenes in blue. And we're applying it uh, over 10 years. Um, so it's, you know, two UTM zones, uh, a lot of data. And then we're also expanding to um, apply metric in southern Nevada. Um, and that's tentatively five years. And the reason we're at the 10 years in the original study is that's when the reference ET site went in in Fallon. So before that, there just wasn't a lot of data. So uh, it's, it's tough to apply the model. Um, but our effort has is, is been to um, generate estimates in-house as well as to support the state. So that's kind of the slant of this is how, you know, how we're, we're trying to do that. Um, so how do we generate estimates um, faster and cheaper and easier and um, help the state do this on their own? Because, you know, they're going to take metric and, and run it forward, and so they need to be able to do it easily and in-house. Um, so what we did is we decided to reconfigure metric away from the ERDAS model, and um, we wanted to make it just easier to use. Um, we wanted to improve the documentation, at least the, my take on the documentation, and, um, you know, like I said, reduce the hardware costs and software costs if possible. Uh, then I'm going to, another way to improve efficiency is just different data, different input data, different ancillary data. How can we just speed up the whole process of applying this? And then finally, automation. You know, what can we do to, to automate this? So. The first thing we did was we applied metric uh, to, or we, we used, we applied metric to ArcGIS and Python, um, and that was, um, kind of for a number of reasons. One is the state of Nevada, or the, the system of higher education has a site license park GIS, so we have as many copies as we need. So that made it kind of a, a natural choice, whereas we only had a few copies of ERDAS. Um, and the other big benefit that we found is that we can run this from a single um, file with a single input file. So the entire model, um, I mean, there's, there's ancillary data, but it's you, you hit enter and you pick some points and let it go. Um, and the, what I thought the best part is that we log everything. We log every input parameter, every process, every calculation to a text file. And so it, it makes it something that if, if we need to go back and figure out what was done and, and you know, how we got to that estimate, it's really easy to do. And it's, um, I think it's easier to, to track what we did. Uh, and so the, the, I guess I just need to plug Python. It's the best programming language if, you, if you're into programming. I, uh, open source, open platform, that allows us to run on um, any computers, you know, Macs, Linux, uh, Windows. Um, it's free. You can download it all, all you want. It's installed with ArcGIS. Um, and the one really nice thing, and I think why a lot of people are using it, is you can call ArcGIS functions directly from Python. So if you want to project a raster, hit enter and you're done. Um, so it makes it really easy to work with. Here's just an example of some of our, uh, we have our info file, just I, I cut out a piece of it, and then our part of our log file. Um, just to show, I, I think this is the way to kind of track what happens. It, Excel always kind of scares me, because you, I don't know, it just seems like it's easy to change a field and not know what happened. And this way, we know exactly what was run, what was saved. Um, and it's easy to turn models on and off. We have, you know, different G functions, different, you know, um, anything. You can just toggle a, a field and move on. So Justin showed this slide yesterday, but I, I, I can't do ERDAS. I, I just can't handle that. Um, if you want to run seven iterations of that loop, it's, it's, to me it's not obvious, whereas I can just change my six to a seven and move on. I can test for stability. It, it, it just made, it seemed like a natural fit for what we were doing. But I, um, I also have to thank Rick for doing all the hard work, you know, his team doing all the hard work getting it to there, so I can't discount that. Um, so then, what we've just kind of recently started doing is how do we use other input data? And so one is the lead apps data. Um, and this, I, I think it's a really great product. They uh, provide a, a top of atmosphere reflectance and an at surface reflectance. Um, it's used the MODIS 6S uh, methodology for the radiometric calibration and the atmosphere correction. And um, I don't know, that's kind of where we're going. I'll explain kind of why we're, we wanted to make it work, um, make metric work with that, but uh, in a second. And then some other things is the, the cloud masks. Um, for our project, we just had a student digitizing clouds, and that, um, 
it works, but it, you know, we need to see where can we, can we improve that. If the state's going to go forward, that, you know, we can't have Adam spending his time digitizing clouds when there's bigger, uh, bigger tasks. So can we use automated cloud masks? Um, the ACCA one is in Landsat. It's not very good. Uh, lead apps has a cloud mask. And then um, the F mask one that was just recently published is, is pretty good. So, but they're not perfect. And so I'll talk about kind of some of the issues with that. And then finally, how do we apply metric using uh, GDAL and Python? So GDAL or I don't know if there's a better way to say it, that's what I call it, but it's an open source JS library. So it's, we get rid of ArcGIS entirely. Um, and it's, <laughs> I, I agree. Uh, ArcGIS is expensive. I mean, we have a site license, but what if somebody doesn't? How can we make this something we can um, run a lot of places? The other benefit is ArcGIS, it's not actually multiprocessor, even though it kind of says it is. Um, it, it's not really, so don't. Um, but with GDAL and Python, we can. We, uh, DRI and UNR both have cluster computers. They're pretty small, and um, can we run metric there? Um, we're also looking at, um, and I'll talk about we're partnering with Forrest and maybe running metric on some of the NASA computers. You know, can we, can we change the whole paradigm of how we run metric away from a single scene to, to something else? And, um, but I, I say that, you also, there's caution in that. I, Users are extremely, extremely, extremely important. You need to understand what's happening. Um, you need to understand the pitfalls. And so how do we use automation to support users instead of replacing them? Um, and I, I really like automating code, but I, the more I do it, the more I realize this is really, really critical. And we can't get rid of that. Um, but also, how do we let users focus on calibrating? Because I think that's where they're really important. I mean, that's where they can see it. And, and can we get the user out of all the steps you know, kind of in between? and, and just improve the process. Um, so I'm going to give two examples of kind of automation and users, and um, they're, they're pretty simple. And then finally, I'm going to talk about our automated calibration of metric. And um, there's kind of two uh, approaches. The first is, can we just generate first order ET estimates? Can we just, can we get to a first ET map that we can give to a user to then calibrate and, and, and maybe simplify some of that? So if, um, and then second, can we fully automate it? And I, you know, maybe. Uh, so example of weather data QAQC, um, Dr. Allen's team has a great um, automated QAQC program that, that's really great and it uh, works pretty well. And you have to do this. You have to QAQC your weather data. This is a, um, the solar data and you can, it's yearly cycles and you can see the sensor just isn't, the, the black is the clear sky um, and it's just not getting up there. And so there's something happening and then they went and cleaned it or you know, wiped off whatever's on it and oh, now it's back to the clear sky. So you have to look at this data and you have to, to adjust it or, you know, or at least consider what's happening there. Um, I, Justin or Rick can talk to how this works if you're interested, but it's really nice. Uh, relative humidity. Um, so this is the, the max daily relative humidity and you can just see over years that it's just dropping. It's not 100% anymore, it's 90 and you know, it should be able to, to get up there. And so that's a, just an example of a, you, know, you need to look at this data, it's really important. And, and an automated approach can do a lot of that. Can it can correct some of that, um, but it can't correct everything. This was uh, when we were looking in the Central Valley of California. We just pulled up a SIMA site and pulled a year and ran it through the the model. And this um, 20 days of solar radiation was just half of what it should be. And we don't know why. And we called them and they said, "Well, it just happens." So, um, you know, and, and it wasn't flagged. That was the thing that was that I found interesting. There was no uh, data quality flags because it's not above the the clear sky, it's below, and that can happen. So um, it's important, it's, it's really, really important to, to look at data. And that's what I said, where how can we let users do this part of it and, and maybe skip some of the other parts? Cloud masks, uh, same thing, I, I just pulled a quick scene out of the Central Valley, and um, this is the cloud mask from the lead apps data. Um, and it, it's beautiful. I mean, if you've digitized clouds, you know what it takes to do that, to, to identify every scene and, and digitize it. But it's not perfect. There's those little puffy clouds that are kind of small, and I don't know if we'll ever fully automate detecting those. You know, we don't have enough bands on the current Landsats to do that. And so it's, you have to look at scenes. You have to look at every, you know, every piece of data. But this is a lot easier for a user to work with than digitizing the whole thing from the start. So. I see that as kind of the where we can go and how we can use this, and um, you know maybe just a, a buffer on these clouds would you know catch some of those, or maybe there's another a better process. But um, 
And then kind of what I mean by over mask or under mask is no model, your no, no automated um, cloud detection routine is gonna be perfect, so you're either gonna miss clouds and they're gonna go into your model, or you're gonna over mask and, and you know, to, to guarantee you capture them and then you have to get to fill the clouds. So either one of those, there's uncertainty and you have to, you have to think about that and address it. Um, so how do we automate metric? Um, it really means automating the CIMIC, calib CIMIC calibration process and that's picking the hot and cold pixels. Um, and the, the issue with the process is that users will calibrate scenes differently. Uh, and this is what we'll show in a second, but it's, there is an uncertainty because of who calibrates a scene. It's, it's um, there isn't a perfect calibration, you know, that's how I'll put it. So it's, you, you have to consider that, um, and what's the impact? How does this affect our daily and our seasonal ET estimates? Um, and so finally, how should an automated routine handle this uncertainty? If people are different, how do we have a computer do this process, you know, to, to mimic that kind of user difference or, um, you just need to, to think about that. And the last is causes of calibration uncertainty. And I experience, it's experience, I mean that's, you know, it, it's other things but it's really experience. What we've seen is the, the first year uh, when we have a student come in and go through the process and that first year it's almost, I don't wanna say garbage, but it, they have to redo it. Um, just because they don't know, you know, they don't know what they're looking for, they don't, you know. And so it, this is the key and I think that's what's gonna drive a lot of this uncertainty that I'm talking about, but um, our, our pool of users has a, a diversity of experience and background and training and so that kind of went into our thinking on how we approach this is we need to, to address that. Uh, here's our study area that we use for the process. It's Western Nevada, Fallon, Mason Valley, Carson Valley. Um, kind of see that it's, it's little small pockets of agriculture in valleys surrounded by mountains and, and desert so it's a little different than the Snake River Plain or Central Valley or some of the bigger areas. Um, so the first thing we did is we had um, six users all calibrate the same scene for a year and, and just to see what's, what's the difference. What do they notice and, and what we want to look is how do we compare those users. And so we decided is the, the distribution of ETRF. So we just made a histogram of the agricultural ETRF values um, in that study area and plotted it. Um, and what you see is there's a, there's a pretty good spread there. Um, some of the calibrations maybe aren't the best but that's what what somebody thought was, was you know, a good calibration. So this is just to show that you, you have to think about this and um, it's there. It's, uh, you know, each person is gonna get a slightly different result. Um, but the other problem with this is it's a small sample size. Um, we didn't really feel like we could just take this, this small set and, and apply that, so we, we decided let's kind of make an automated routine to generate a large number of estimates that mimics these and Maybe we can use that to actually get some statistics on this, this variation. So how we approach this, and I, I don't claim that this is the best method. Um, some of the stuff Dr. Allen and this group's doing with, the, with pixel collection is great. I'm sure there's other people working on this. This was just our, our take on it. Um, what we found is that when a user calibrates a scene, what they're looking at is that distribution. They're looking for fields that are too high or fields that are too low or um, something that you know they know is an alpha alpha field with cuttings and it's just not the right ET value. So let's try to mimic that. And so we, we said is let's take the tail sizes of that distribution. So what percentage of fields are outside the, the typical metric calibration threshold of you know, 0.1 and 1.05 for the ETRF. And so, so we plotted that and what we found is through time and, and between users, it was pretty consistent during the growing season. And it, it wasn't consistent outside the growing season, which, because um, it's hard to calibrate metric when there's snow on the ground or, you know, some other issues. But during the growing season, it was, it was fairly consistent. Most of the time, they were um, pretty small and all the, yes, it's a, a CDF of the plots and the, the dash is the cold. And so, you know, 50% of the time, that tail size is, you know, less than a percent and 80% 80 80 of the time, it's less than 2%. So it's it's just a really small fraction of fields that are going over those thresholds. And so that was, we decided to kind of move forward with this. Um, one thing is that the cold pixel is a lot easier to define than the hot, so that's kind of why the, the CDF is so much tighter on that side. Um, and you'll, you know, we all know that. I mean, if you've applied metric, you know, it's hard to pick that hot field. There's a lot of, um, um, zero ET can look like a lot of things. You know, it can have a lot of different reflectances and surface temperatures and, or, or low ET, so. Um, the only thing we did is we ran the model. 
so we ran it 100 times per Landsat scene, um, and, and these user calibrations and these plots weren't, we didn't use those to train the model, so they, I mean, there's, there's some kind of difference in the, um, the, the, the testing, the, the, the input data of the model and the, and the verification, um, and it works pretty well. I mean, we captured the spread of our users, um, and it, it, you know, we, it's, a, it's a pretty um, reasonable way to, to approach this, we thought. And, um, you can see, though, the spread on, you know, there's a couple calibrations there where there's a lot of fields over 1.05, and that, maybe that's not totally real, but it's, um, you know, we wanted, to, we wanted to know what that, what, what that was doing to our data. A um, couple more, uh, really, you know, peak, uh, everything's green. Um, again, you can see the spread. It, when it gets out of the growing season, stuff kind of, you know, there's a lot more variability, but the ET's less, so it, that trade-off. Um, again, this variability, or, our, our automated approach was representative of our users. It's, you know, they're, some of these maybe, you know, would have been uh, cleaned up a little. Um, and I, I have to plug, using these distributions, a great way to test users' um, calibrations and just to see if, if um, your eye naturally picks up that just stuff is too high or too low or, you know, where, you know, what an alfalfa field should look like. So I think it's a really good way to look at, at this data. Um, so then we, Per field, we calculated the seasonal ET. Um, did, you know, averaged uh, the ET for each of the 100 runs, made a separate seasonal estimate, and then um, calculated statistics. And um, so you can see for high ET fields, uh, it's low variation, and that's to be expected. I mean, as you that that cold calibration point is really consistent, and so we we expect there to be less variation there. And the hot fields, there's more, um, but the ET is less, so it's uh, it's not as uh, big an issue. Um, but it was. The overall, what we you know we kind of call calibration uncertainty was approximately five percent for our study area, which I was. I mean, I guess on one hand that's a lot of water, um, but it it's pretty good. I mean, that's when you think about how different users are and and the model itself. Um, that was we were pretty excited about that. Uh, so it's just an example of kind of that per field variation. So we, you know, we have the, the mean from all our runs and the standard deviation, and um, it just gives us a way to look at, at this data like we had 100 users, you know, because we, we can kind of mimic those, that variation. Um, and let's, you know, see where is the, where is the, the large variance and where is the small. So uh, just one example. Yeah, next one. Um, so the next thing we want to do, let's just do a blind comparison. Uh, let's run our automated approach and compare it to some measured ET data and just see what happens. Um, and this is uh, entirely uh, hands off. You know, we we hadn't seen any of the data when we made the calibrations, so we, we thought it was a good approach. Uh, there have been two USGS studies uh, in Western Nevada, one in Mason Valley where they set up two, um, I think Bowen Towers, uh, Bowen Ridge stations, and then in Carson Valley they set up uh, eight sites, but only six of them were actually in agriculture, so we used those. Um, and these were about two years for each of them. Some, was, some of them were less data because they moved some of the stations around, um, but generally one to two years. Yeah, you just have to. And so these are the results. Um, it, we took all the, the scenes where we, it was cloud free and all the measured data for that same day and, and plotted them and we're, you know, it, it, it's not perfect. I think there's a lot of, um, if, a, if a person had, had gone in and checked every calibration, they you know, probably could have refined this a little, but it was a good, I think kind of, uh, first check on this type of approach and what I think we need to do for any automated approach. You, know, you have to, at some point, how, does, how well does it compare back to some measured data and, and, you know, is it reasonable? And so we have the daily plots and then kind of a, an average daily um, just over the, the season and seasons kind of where we had data, so it's um, a little different. But it, it compared really well. Um, and, and the one other thing I want to say about this is sites ET2, 328 in that Carson Valley, we didn't None of our calibrations going into the approach you were um, from Carson Valley, and Carson Valley has a really unique um, kind of uh, ET rate. I guess it's it's very windy and it's cooler and it's just kind of different than Mason Valley and Fallon. So it was a it was a pretty good check on um, on that approach. You know that we can kind of it's a, it's a first check that we can apply this somewhere else using calibrations that are outside um, those. And so. 
that led to the, this is the big question, and this is kind of what we're working on right now is, does this work anywhere else? I mean, is, are we limited by our study area and our calibrations, or is the, does, is the method something that can be used, you know, anywhere? I mean, is the, would any group of users in any study area come up with a similar a distribution? Um, and we, like I said, we intentionally left in all our calibrations. Some of this variance or, or variability may be uh, excessive because of that, but I think, you know, like I said, it's real. It's what the community, you know, there's, there's grad students calibrating scenes and there's trained experts, so you have to consider both those. Um, and I think really the big question, and hopefully how this kind of ties into the, some of the other talks, is, is this, um, is the uncertainty for monocalibration calibration worth it? I mean, there's, there's, we're adding uncertainty when we do that. We know that. And so if we make a first order estimate using this, you know, and, and is that, does that trade off pay off? Um, and I think it does. I think um, we almost have to if we're going to use metric and, and other remote sensing methods. Um, so, and the thing I like, it's repeatable. I, you know, we know kind of exactly what, what led to a result and we can recreate that really easily. Um, and just the documentation, I think it's, um, I think it's a good way to go. You know, we know why we're, we're, we're picking scenes the certain way we are. So then, what's the future of this? Um, if we want to run kind of on grid computers, cloud computers, you have to, I think, get away from, um, you know, the ERDAS and ArcGIS and, and go to some of these open source, um, you know, processes. And so that's, that's much easier with the GDAL and Python approach. I'm sure there's other ways to do it. That was just what, you know, we had and what we knew. So that's uh, our, our idea. And DRI is collaborating with um, NASA Ames with Forrest. Uh, so we're going to try to run metric on their computers. Um, and that's why we had to go to the lead apps, because uh, that's what they have already loaded. And um, that's why we're kind of looking at some of these automated ways. You know, what, what you know, we, we can't go and digitize clouds for um, thousands of scenes. So what happens if we use some of the automated cloud maps? Uh, and I, 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 I hate when people say like changing a paradigm, but I think that's really what we have to, to get to is how do we run metric for states and years, not scenes? You know, can we, can we pre-run metric and then, you know, so when Adam goes to run 2012, it's already, it's already has a first pa pass and he can just, um, you know, check scenes. I think that's a, maybe a more efficient way to approach this instead of um, running model after model after model. Um, so that's, that's just kind of where I, I think we're headed and hopefully get to, so I don't know.